What is up guys, we're going to be taking a look at this lab, manipulating WebSocket messages to exploit vulnerabilities. This particular lab is designed as an introduction to WebSockets. A logical starting point is to recap on what exactly WebSockets are. WebSockets are bi-directional communication initiated over HTTP. If we think about the regular way in which a web app works, the user sends a HTTP request, the web server sends a response to that request. The web server doesn't contact the user outside of responding to the user's HTTP requests. The difference with a WebSocket is it's an open two-way communication. So the user can contact the web app at any point. The web app can also contact the user at any point. So a simple example could be some sort of chat application. Maybe we're dealing with chat support. Well, chat support needs to be able to send a message to the user at any point. So a WebSocket would be used for this. Otherwise, the user would have to send a HTTP request to refresh the page to see if there's any update to the support chat. WebSockets, two-way communication at any point. A WebSocket connection can be created using JavaScript. For example, we can create a new WebSocket. You can see two different types of protocols. WS, that's going to be over an unencrypted connection. We have WSS, which is going to be an encrypted TLS, transport layer security connection. Sometimes you'll still see this referred to as SSL, but actually TLS has replaced SSL. So we've mentioned that initially the WebSocket is going to be opened using HTTP. We can see an example of that. So first of all, a regular HTTP GET request is sent. Now notice the headers here. First of all, we have a connection header with keep alive and upgrade. We also have an upgrade header with WebSocket. This is part of the WebSocket handshake. You can see in the response, those two headers are reflected back. So we have upgrade WebSocket. We then have connection upgrade. So this is the response as part of the WebSocket handshake. Also in part of the initial request, we have the WebSocket version requested, 13 in this case. We also send a WebSocket key it's simply going to be randomly generated, but the idea is the response is going to send a hash of that WebSocket key. So although it starts with a HTTP request and response, this is referred to as the WebSocket handshake, we now have a two-way WebSocket open. Once a WebSocket connection has been established, Messages can be sent asynchronously in either direction by the client or server. I have an example that WS variable we defined earlier, dot send, followed by a message that's now going to be sent to the server via WebSocket. You can send any content or data format over a WebSocket. However, it is still fairly typical to see a JSON object sent over a WebSocket. So hopefully you have a fairly good high level overview of WebSockets. Let's see an example in practice as we take a look at this lab, manipulating WebSocket messages to exploit vulnerabilities. We're here on the home page of the web app. We can see in the top right, we have the option to join live chat. As we mentioned earlier, it's very likely that live chat is going to be run over a WebSocket. Let's send a quick message to chat support. The responses are typically meaningless, but it allows us to simulate what support chat might look like. Now here in Burp Suite, we can see a log of the HTTP history. But remember, WebSockets aren't really HTTP as such. They're initiated over HTTP, but then they become a WebSocket. And if we want to track WebSocket traffic, instead of HTTP history, we actually want to go to this next tab in Burp, WebSockets history. Now we can see that the majority of the WebSockets are actually just ping and pong messages. This is something used just to check if the connection is still active. We can see those have a length of four. If we check out some of the longer WebSockets, first of all, here we can see our message sent as part of a JSON object. We can see our message is part of the content key here. And we can also see the response from the server sent via WebSocket, again, using the same JSON object notation. 
But remember we said this was originally initiated over HTTP. If we head back to the HTTP history, we can see a get request to forward slash chat. Take a look at the headers in this request. So we have our WebSocket key, and we also have the two headers we mentioned as part of the initial WebSockets handshake. So we have connection upgrade. We also have upgrade WebSocket. And if we check out the response, we see those two headers reflected back at us, connection, upgrade, upgrade, WebSocket. We can then see a hash of the key that we sent in our request. So we can see the initial WebSocket handshake taking place over HTTP, but then the subsequent WebSocket traffic we can see in the WebSockets history tab. When we're testing web apps in general, one of the things we're always looking out for is a point of ingress, a section of the app where we can provide user supplied input, because if we can provide corrupted input, it can provoke a vulnerability in the web app. And WebSockets are no exception to that. We're providing input to the web app via WebSocket. And furthermore, we get the idea that anything we provide to the live chatbot here is actually reflected to the page. So if I send the message reflection, we can see our message reflected to the page. So user supplied input is eventually displayed as output on the page. So the logical question is, what happens if we try and input script tags, for example, and run a JavaScript alert function? Let's just try script and see what happens. Send this to the page. And we can see it's reflected back to us. It's not included as part of the DOM. So immediately we're assuming there must be some type of HTML encoding here so that the script tags are displayed correctly when they're reflected back to us on the page. Now, when we take a look at that particular WebSocket, we can see as part of the content key there, we have our script tags, which have been HTML encoded. So that's why they're displaying safely on the page. But if you're familiar with how HTML encoding works, immediately alarm bells should be going off here because the way this should typically work is we send our input to the server. The server then HTML encodes the input and sends it back to the browser so it's displayed safely. That's not what's happening here. The front end has actually HTML encoded our input before sending it to the server. So it's trying to sanitize the input on the user side. But it's important to remember that a tool like Burp Proxy actually sits between the front end or the browser and the back end, the server. So if something is HTML encoded on the front end, it's then sent through Burp. Well, we can simply strip that front end HTML encoding and this is exactly why the HTML encoding needs to be applied server side, because we can still tamper with this before it reaches the server. So it's honestly going to be as simple as replacing the HTML encoded left bracket with a plain left bracket. It's not going to be HTML encoded again. Now, in a similar way that we can send HTTP requests to the repeater, we can also send WebSockets to the repeater. So instead of the HTML encoded content, Let's enter a full payload with vanilla left and right brackets. We have image source equals one. Of course, the source attribute is going to error out. On error, we're going to alert one to the page. We've sent that to the back end. We can see now that that is immediately reflected to the page. Let's see that again. We'll send the same message to the back end. As soon as we hit send, we can see the JavaScript alert rendered to the page and can see JavaScript is now being executed in our browser. Now it does take a moment to think about the implications of this. So if we think about something like a cross-site scripting attack, usually we'd perhaps be sharing a vulnerable URL with the victim. The victim follows that URL. There's then a reflected cross-site scripting attack, or perhaps there's something stored on the page. The victim visits that page and the cross-site scripting attack is executed. Well, how do we share this particular attack with the victim? There's no link that we can send here. It's not part of the URL. It's not necessarily stored on the page. So what is the attack vector here? The attack vector is support in this case, because remember this is being rendered in our chat. It's also being rendered in the chat of the support worker. So whichever JavaScript is being executed in our browser is also being executed on the other browser that's being used as part of this chat. So imagine we have an agent that's logged in. They have admin access to the back end of the live chat here, and we have the ability to run arbitrary JavaScript in their browser. Of course, if it is a chat bot, 
it could be that the JavaScript doesn't really do anything in the case of the chatbot because the chatbot is very likely not operating within a browser, but certainly if it's a human chat agent and we can execute arbitrary JavaScript in their browser, assuming that they are operating with advanced privileges relative to us, then we have potentially quite a serious vulnerability. In some ways, the mitigation for this particular vulnerability is not specifically related to WebSockets, it's more to do with correct use of HTML encoding. So if we want left and right brackets to be non-functional on a page, when we return the HTML from the server, we HTML encode values that we want to be displayed as plain text on the web app. So in this case, the HTML encoding happened at the wrong stage of the process because it was encoded on the front end before it was sent to the server. Whereas we always want to run our HTML encoding and general sanitization server side because the user doesn't have the ability to manipulate what's taking place on the server. So mitigation here is run the sanitization and HTML encoding on the server and this vulnerability no longer exists. All right, that's pretty much it for this lab. Hopefully it was a good high level introduction to WebSockets. Thanks for checking out the content and I'll catch you guys in the next lab.